you in just a second. You're on. Laurie, I think you're still muted. <laughs> uh, okay, I think. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, and I think you can see my slides okay? Absolutely. Just make okay, it a wonderful. window and you're good to go. Okay, I think everything's working. Well, thank you for the invitation to um, be part of this webinar today. Um, so thank you, Benedict, for introducing us. And it's great to be here with you, Margaret, um, to share with you some information on this topic. So first of all, I'm going to give an overview of um, this topic and issue so you know the focus of our presentation. And then I will um, speak about some of the research that I've been involved with in this topic. And then Margaret will be um, joining you for the second part of the presentation today. So I get this question sometimes when I talk about this issue to the general public. So what does gender have to do with intimate partner violence in later life? So hopefully that will become a little bit clearer to you. I do recognize a lot of the names as people have been joining and I know many of you are, are experts in this topic. So it's lovely to see you joining with us today. And there's others who perhaps this is a, a newer topic for you. So just to give us a bit of background, this is the type of abuse that we are focused on today. So this is just a, a visual description of what intimate partner violence is like. There's lots of different types of abuse and violence, but I'm focused particularly on intimate partner violence. So this is a cyclical type of violence where, you know, tension builds, there's a violent episode, and then the honeymoon stage. And the idea is that this cycle continues over time and often intensifies over time as well. So just that's the type of abuse um, we're focused on today. Some of you might be familiar with these wheels of power and control, especially the one on the left-hand side, um, which really shows how um, people um, obtain and maintain power and control in relationships using various methods. And the wheel on the right-hand side was developed specifically for older women. So it's a little bit simplified compared to the one on the left, which was developed primarily um, focused on abuse that um, younger women experience. So it does remove a few of the, the specific aspects. So that one was that developed one. for older women um, in particular. So just a few overarching concepts just to get us started um, thinking about this. In, in general, there tends to be less emphasis in research and supports and services that are devoted to meeting the needs of older women who experience intimate partner violence versus younger women. And then I have two statements that probably need a little bit of explanation. So these are my, there's no reference cited here, so this is my, my thoughts on this topic. There tends to be ageism in domestic violence or family violence um, research and services. And what I mean by that is that there tends to be not as much focus on the needs of older people versus younger people. And also there's sexism in elder abuse research and services. And what I mean by that is that there tends to not be a focus on gender when we talk about issues for older people who experience abuse. So this topic that we're talking about today kind of falls between these two, two areas of domestic violence and, and elder abuse, which is a really interesting um, place to be working in between these two, two domains. Some additional um, overarching concepts to just keep in mind is that all forms of abuse, no matter what we're talking about, do tend to be underreported. So it's really difficult sometimes to know the full extent of abuse that occurs. Um, we hypothesize that it's perhaps even more challenging for older women to report abuse than younger women. So it's really difficult to know the full scope of this issue. We know that abuse can occur in many forms and that often more than one form of abuse is experienced at the same time. And the last bullet there is um, just some different ways that my colleagues and I have um, thought about the kind of diverse situations that older women can experience intimate partner violence. So it could be a situation where a woman is experiencing abuse in one long-term relationship, or it could be abuse in a relationship that begins later in life, so a new relationship. 
It also could be a situation where women experience abuse throughout many different relationships over time, or possibly a long-term relationship that became abusive. So we've added to this list over time, probably the first type that I was um, thought about was the first one, the long-term abusive relationship, but certainly these other contexts can be um, experienced as well. Uh, this is a table that was developed by a master's student, Crystal LeBlanc, that I, I supervised, and it really is just a comparison of some of the key factors in the left-hand column that are about the, the development and how we think about abuse, the causes, who the abuser is, etc. So this is a really kind of interesting comparison that Crystal made between intimate partner violence and elder abuse, and it really kind of shows us that these two areas have really kind of developed in parallel and, and quite differently, and, and how we think about them and the history is, is really quite different. So now I'm going to um, give you a really brief tour or overview of um, some of the research that I've been involved with on intimate partner violence for, for some time now. And I'm going to go relatively quickly through, through some of these studies. I've included my sources for each one, and there is a reference list if you'd like to, to look up any one of them in particular. And I'm always happy to talk to anyone who'd like more information about any of, of this research. So first I'm going to talk a little bit about a, a research synthesis that um, I did or led a, a few years ago. So one of the interesting results is that we found um, 32 peer-reviewed articles or studies that um, did study the older women who experienced abuse. So these were research studies that older women who experienced abuse actually participated in. And we used the ecological model that you can see in the bottom right-hand corner to help us kind of organize the results and to think about what we found across these different studies. So various factors that affected the, the woman in particular, and then really thinking more broadly about the human and built environment and cultural context that the woman lives in. So the ecological model was, was really useful. So we certainly found a lot of parallels for women who experience abuse um, in younger years, and perhaps it's surprising that we did find these results. So. Um, I think this was kind of a nice synthesis of what we do know about um, older women and research on older women. Certainly there can be a lot of negative outcomes for abuse. There's lots of issues of short and long-term you know, safety needs and housing needs. We find that often people around the woman aren't particularly helpful in, in responding to her. They may also view into a partner violence differently, possibly than younger women because of the age and cohort that the women belong to. So their thinking about patriarchy and family privacy may differ for some women because of age. So we certainly know that this issue is complicated but because of the research that we know has been done. So it is a complicated topic and we, we probably need diverse interventions and there's perhaps not one thing that will meet the needs of all women. Um, a, a very recent study that I've been involved in lately was an online survey of professionals working um, in PEI and New Brunswick in particular. And this was a really interesting study. We came up with some kind of interesting results. So basically we, uh, we sent the survey to professionals working with older adults and a subset of them worked particularly with abused older adults. So we found that um, the types of abuse that these um, professionals worked with were pretty equal in terms of the abuse of older women and the ab abuse of older men, which was quite fascinating to us. Um, we kind of concluded that there's probably a need for education and awareness raising around issues of gender for people who are working with older adults. They may not really detect much difference in terms of differences between men and women. And in this next slide is another way of looking at some of the data that we found. Um, that the topics that participants wanted more information about was pretty equal when we asked them about intimate partner violence of older women and older men. So there wasn't a big difference there in terms of gender. In this study, the only area that we really found um, a gender difference really was in the number and percentage of abused older adults that these professionals actually worked with um, through their organizations. So we did find some differences there. So this study really made us think about, so why are professionals not really 
um, thinking are focused on gender issues. And we actually did some follow-up focus groups recently um, to find out um, you know, why we found these results and to just get a little bit more insight. So we don't have the results of those focus groups yet, but we will, <laughs> we will shortly. Um, and we'll hopefully be able to explain these results a bit more. But it certainly did highlight for us that there didn't seem to be a gender focus amongst many professionals who work with older adults and especially abused older adults. So a big question for us is that what kind of supports should be available available for older women who experience abuse. So this is a, a really important question. Um, James Dickinson and Struthers um, did a, wrote a really interesting article that's referred there at the bottom of the slide that really identified that there's two um, main types or models of supports that are available currently. And they did a really nice job of identifying um, these two different, more first shorter term and then longer term, and some specific examples in Canada. So there's not a huge amount of resources specifically for the needs of older adults, but there's some really nice examples in this article of some models in Canada. A few years ago, I, I supervised a, a student that was really interested in finding out from shelter directors, emergency shelters, um, whether they work with older women and basically are these shelters ready to meet the needs of older women. So Crystal LeBlanc um, did a survey, an online survey with shelter directors in Atlantic Canada, and she followed that up with telephone interviews as well. So one of the most interesting results that she found in her thesis was that 29% um, of the people who used shelter services when during the time that she did her study were actually considered at midlife and older. Um, that might have, that result might have had to do a bit with um, people had a self-definition of what midlife was. We didn't actually include a specific age, um, but there was certainly a large number who were considered at midlife or older. There was also some really interesting specific results from this study that really um, showed us what shelter directors um, have been thinking about the needs of older and younger women. So 88% said that older women do have different needs than younger women, but 82% didn't currently have any special programming for older women in particular, and 76% did have challenges in meeting the needs of older women. So transition houses certainly offer um, a safe environment for, for women and the basic necessities of life, but in general, our conclusion was that the majority of these transition houses um, do fall short in meeting the needs of older women. So the next question is, are transition houses the best services for women in midlife and older experiencing intimate partner violence, and what else should be available? So my colleagues and I did another study um, in Atlantic Canada and specifically focused on resources that older women used after or during and after leaving an abusive partner. And another aspect of this study is that we focused on rural women in particular. So we interviewed eight women, actually, who experienced intimate partner violence um, when they were at least age 50 and older, who had left that abusive partner, and they used at least one service in leaving their partner, and also, as I said, lived in a rural place in one of the maritime provinces. So this slide is a summary of the different types of supports that the women actually used. Um, through these interviews, we didn't give them a list. We asked them what types of supports that they use. So we developed them into these different categories. So you can see that all of the eight women used certain things like support from friends and neighbors and most from family members and all from the criminal justice system and financial resources. So we can see that there's some types of supports that were really crucial for all of the women. Um, interestingly, five of the women of the eight used family violence services, so services specifically designed for women experiencing um, an abusive relationship. And you can see some of the other types of supports that the women use. So it's really interesting for us to see what, what supports did these women use. It was certainly a diverse list. 
a little different way of looking at the data is in this slide. So the pseudonym of the participants is, is on the left. And what we really found is that for, for each woman, there was kind of a unique mix of types of services that she used or resources in, in leaving an abusive partner. Um, so it was interesting to look at each woman's story to see the kinds of things that, that she used. There were several reasons that some of the women didn't use a serve an emergency shelter, even if there was one in existence that she could use. For some of these older women, women they were really taught that you don't talk about personal issues outside of the family. Um, a lot of concerns about safety um, in using these types of services. Um, some women felt that going to a, an emergency shelter wouldn't fix the problem basically. Um, they felt that they didn't have enough information or had misinformation about emergency shelters. Um, five, I think, was something that was really important to some of these older women, was that going to a shelter would mean giving up their life, their environment, their, their community, the supports around them. So kind of being separated from the life that they built was not a very good option for some of these older women. And for some women, they didn't need um, emergency shelters because they had access to other kinds of supports and services. So from this study, we concluded that both um, paid and unpaid or formal and informal resources are important to these women. Um, they sometimes have challenges um, in using resources, especially um, older women living in rural places. Um, resources do need to be very accessible. Um, and need to be very confidential. So being able to use services in rural places can be a challenge in terms of confidentiality. Um, the next bullet is really important that some women want the abuse to stop but don't really want to have a huge upheaval um, in her life, including losing her home, her belongings, and social support. So that's important, I think, for women of all ages, but especially for women who may have been living in a community for a long period of time. There's huge challenges and barriers there, I think, to leaving um, an abusive relationship. And then finally, we, we, need, we do realize that training is needed for not just people working in really a, a specific area of service, but um, women might use supports um, across a lot of different types of supports and services out there. So I, I think there really is a need for training for people working in a, a wide variety of services. So the last um, slide here. Oh, thank you, because I'm almost done. <laughs> um, I'm trying not to go too fast. And as I said, there's um, certainly lots more detail for, um, included about each of these studies. I'm just trying to highlight the, the key things that we've learned over time, and, and the full references are there, and I'm always happy to provide further information. So after thinking about some of these results that we found, um, we've come up with three options. And this doesn't mean that you have to necessarily pick one of these. They're just kind of for people to think about what, what really should we do in terms of addressing the needs of, of older women. So option one is that older women have unique needs and services and, and we need to really design separate services for them to meet their needs. So, so that's one option. Option two is that older women or all women who experience intimate partner violence really experience the same kinds of things and need the same sorts of services. So maybe we can just make sure that we, we offer a service but it is inclusive of women of all ages. Or option three is that each woman who experiences intimate partner violence has unique needs and services should be tailored to meet the needs of each woman, so from a much more person-centered perspective. So these are just some things to think about, some options and ways to think about how we should be developing um, services to meet the needs of older women experiencing intimate partner violence in the future. So I've listed here my acknowledgments of various other research collaborators that I've worked with for quite some time. Some of you might be on the call today and funding from various organizations as well. And as I said, I've listed the references that I've referred to. So I think now we're on to Margaret for her part of the presentation. Thank you very much, Lori. Margaret, I'm going to pass this on to you right away. Okay. All right, you should be able to show us your screen now and okay. take it away. 
Okay, so you can see me now? Soon, not yet. I see a white screen for now. So I have my PowerPoint up. I think it's going to happen. It says waiting to view Margaret's screen. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, in the meantime, I want to say that uh, I see uh, lots of familiar names on the list. Uh, so hello, everyone, and uh, thanks so much for joining. There's a number of people who were actually uh, instrumental in the development of uh, the content that I'm going to show you. So it's like being with old friends. All right, Margaret, let's try to see if you can open up that PowerPoint for us now. <laughs> okay, so I have it up on my screen. Okay, have you pressed on show my screen as well? Oh, yes, perhaps that's what I need to do. Hang on. <laughs> Hang on. Uh, yes, that would be the that would be the missing piece. <laughs> no one said I was. Uh, no one said I was a technical whiz. Okay. <laughs> You're doing so, just, just fine. So you can see my screen now. We can now. You just need to pull up the PowerPoint and voila, we're all set. I'll go on mute now. It's your turn. Okay. 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 So. Um, this is about It's Not Right, Neighbors, Friends, and Families for Older Adults, and we're going to focus on the domestic violence piece. And for me, the beginning of this story starts with the Ontario Domestic Violence Death Review Committee, um, which is Ontario-specific. They look at domestic homicides um, after cases are closed in the court system. And what they discovered very early with domestic homicide is that uh, you know, similar to what Lori was uh, talking about, neighbors, friends, and family members are the sort of the go-to people in lots of situations. And they're actually the folks who are most likely to know that a situation is developing or is happening and that the risk is escalating, but often they don't know what to do about it. And so it's not right. Neighbors, friends, and families for older adults was developed um, from Neighbors, Friends and Families, which is an Ontario domestic violence uh, education campaign. And it was the beginning of a journey for me in working with lots of people on the call um, to adapt domestic violence for, you know, into the field of elder abuse. And it has been um, a rich learning journey that continues. So like Neighbors, Friends and Families, what we want to sort of, our goal is quite specific um, because you know, if in fact it's the neighbors, friends, and family members who are most likely to know, then if we teach them how to recognize warning signs and risk factors, and we um, show them how they can respond safely and effectively, what we've learned is that people will take action if they know what to do. And so we're working sort of on a variety of levels here. Um, we do talk about wanting to change social norms and, at, you know, sort of at the personal level around, you know, we've got centuries of training that tells us to mind your own business. And, you know, the, the problem is too complex. There's nothing that can be done about it. And then more sort of at a social level, um, we have these beliefs, uh, uh, you know, that aging diminishes your value. And so you can see that, Lori, I think, um, was pointing to that a little bit in the lack of research around domestic violence in older couples because if you follow the thread about what it means that aging diminishes your value, then it shows up in places like research where the attention is not given to understanding the scope of the project or how violence is different for men and women because it is. And so, you know, it's not just an individual issue. It is absolutely um, a societal problem that shows up in a variety of ways. So I'm also going to talk a little bit about the ecological um, idea that violence in relationships is not just individual based. Um, and then, of course, the, the approach we're taking is about um, engaging everyone. Everyone has a role to play, but you know, in some ways that can be a big amorphous thing. What does that actually mean? And so what we want to do with It's Not Right is to show people that little things they do can make a big difference in a person's life. So um, in a minute, um, we're going to go to this video. So um, Benedict, can you put the, um, the, the 
the link into the chat box so that people can go to it. This is an experiment for us in trying to tie a video into this. And so what will happen is you'll go to the YouTube link, you'll watch the video, and then you'll come back here. Now I just want to set the video up for you just a little bit. Um, so this is a situation where a daughter is visiting her parents and her brother is going to come and pick her up from there. And so uh, we'll uh, watch the story unfold and I would like you to pay attention to the things that might make you feel uncomfortable or um, show up as uh, warning signs and then we'll come back. So is the, uh, so I'm going to go look at myself and just make sure. Oh, and so for those of you who uh, can't use YouTube, like some of you are at government uh, sites, I'm going to put up this screen that shows you um, essentially the story. So if you can't get to the YouTube, this gives you the, you know, the idea about what it is. And so go ahead now and click the link, watch the video, and then we'll come back together. So Benedict, maybe you can signal me when you're back. I'm right here. Okay. So the video is completed for you? I have not watched a video on my end. <laughs> okay. Okay. I could hear one playing. That's all. So I'm just going to give it a minute just to give people to get back some kind. Times it takes a minute to load. And then I'll continue. Perfect. So the little synopsis on the screen there, um, you know, says that this is a private look inside, you know, the home of this couple and, um, and their adult children and what we see happening. At the very end of the scene, you see, um, you know, a, a woman and a man who are uh, alone together in what seems to be an increasingly tense kind of situation. So. I'm going to I'm going to continue now to the next slide. What is does that seem reasonable that everybody's seen the video by now? As I said, this is highly experimental. Don't you love the technology? So let's just think for a minute about you know some of the challenges that Mary, the mother, is facing. Right, power and control are normalized in her relationship when um, uh, the son first enters. You can hear um, her husband calling, I'm waiting, like he's, you know, it's her, it's, it's her role to wait on him. You know, is she trapped by a situation of his deteriorating health and his increasing dependency? Clearly the children, the adult children are distant and unavailable and we're not, I, this, I don't say this to blame them, right? They are all part of a family dynamic and it may very well have been over years of abusive behavior. Certainly, you know, there was um, uh, some verbal um, sort of cues that he's angry and blames them, uh, you know, and is angry with them. And so does Mary know that there might be supports available for her or is this just a spiraling kind of situation? So as Lori suggested, even if she did decide to leave, the shelters are not really prepared to deal with older women. And what's going to happen to her husband? So, you know, what do you think the chances are here that she feels a sense of duty, um, obligation, responsibility, and, you know, love um, to look after him? 
So some of the barriers to seeking help have to be seen as domestic violence grown old, like ageist attitudes that seem to say that somehow or other it's more acceptable because it's always been there. Um, there's also this tendency to blame her. So, you know, she's put up with it all these years. Um, uh, she should have left uh, uh, a long time ago is what her son says at one point. These are long-standing family dynamics. And one of the things we really want to try to do is shift out of a blame game um, and reducing people down to being victims and um, perpetrators, right? These are complicated relationships that require a lot more sophistication and understanding what's happening and figuring out how to move in and actually do things that help them uh, you know, as people, as a family. Uh, clearly dependency issues are happening, um, could be financial issues um, that don't allow them to seek sort of help in the house, um, clearly some physical issues. Um, you know, is it, a is it a deterioration? Is dementia involved? We don't understand whether or not there is just from that little clip. But we know that, like, you know, people are afraid of ending up in a senior's home. They're afraid of separation and change. And there's always shame that goes with these situations. So these are considerable barriers for people to, um, you know, think about what could be different. So this is the ecological model um, from the World Health Organization that says, you know, similar to what Lori was talking about, it's not just an individual issue, right? There's also sort of the, the, the relationships, um, you know, people have different kinds of vulnerabilities. If you are um, uh, lesbian, gay, transgendered, if you are indigenous, if you have a disability, you know, these are all things that complicate the situation you may face multiple oppressions and they add into um, you know sort of your your vulnerability in a relationship the community plays a role and society I'm gonna move to another slide so it's like it's big it's you know it's a big thing and it manifests it shows up in our um, you know individual lives but you know we could ask a question like what is it about our society that creates the conditions for abuse to happen in relationships. And one of the big pieces, I think, is that ageism is a social norm. This is a quote uh, that Charmaine Spencer made a few years ago. I just think it's really, really good because, you know, um, it's, it is such a, a part of our lives. And so she said, to the extent to which older people do not fit the perceived social norm, the younger people, right, they are treated as less which may include being less valued and less visible. They become relegated to second-class status. Their needs and their lives are treated as if they do not matter as much. So when I hear domestic violence grown old, that's what I hear, is that they, it doesn't matter as much because they're older. So she goes on to say that as a society, we seldom think to question the basis for our attitudes and beliefs. People simply incorporate those social norms and values into their way of thinking about and behaving toward older adults. And so if we're going to tackle, uh, you know, the issues of violence in relationships in later life in couples, um, we're going to have to think very carefully about how ageism plays into it. And what do we know about ageism? This is from a Rivera report that was done a couple of years ago. Like 63% of seniors say that they've been treated unfairly differently, right, because of their age. 35% uh, of Canadians admit that they treat people differently based on their age. 79% agree that seniors are less important, like, wow, 79% agree about that seniors are seen as less important. You know, and that shows up in so many sort of structural ways in the system you know, right down to things like how long it takes to cross the road with the beeping light, right? Who's, you know, whose level of ability and age takes into consideration what that takes. So you can see that it's, you know, from an example like that, that we just don't even think about these things. And 21% see older Canadians as a burden. And I'm going to suggest that a lot of that kind of ageism is also internalized, that we ourselves fear getting older, and um, think that believe that we are less than, uh, and uh, you know, so have a harder and harder time sort of putting our needs out. I will never forget my grandmother who used to say, 
never mind about me, dear. As if her feelings and her uh, desires were less important than everyone else's. So there's always many pieces involved, right? Every situation is unique. There are always aspects of identity that include gender, age, race, ability, class, education, economics, right? And that there is discrimination that impacts on those identities and we see it as ageism, sexism, racism, ableism, heterosexism, like the list goes on. But for people where those um, things intersect, uh, the situations are, uh, are, are usually worse and it shows up in the statistics like Indigenous women are um, uh, six times more likely um, to experience uh, violence in their lifetime than uh, non-Indigenous women. So, you know, it, it, it has an impact that sort of if you have multiple oppressions. And then of course there's the larger forces and structures that are at work, the economy, capitalism, social policies, uh, media and war. We know uh, the impact of war on women um, who are often, uh, you know, who experience uh, so many kind of horrific um, experiences at the hands of uh, you know sort of victorious kind of armies. Pre-migration trauma is a really powerful problem for immigrant and refugee uh, men and women coming into this country. So I just I'm going to break it down I want to look at this particular situation to say this is kind of how it shows up uh, you know, in terms of an ecological model. So you have these two people, and yes, there's a history of domestic violence that we can uh, infer from the comments that were made during the, the situation. Around all of that sits ageism and uh, the beliefs that uh, what's happening here is uh, of less import to us as a society, and we show that in a variety of ways. And then there's, you know, sort of a variety of other elements from the social and the relationship community levels, right? Um, shifting power dynamics in their relationship, social expectations about her role, the expectation that she is the one that will take care of him as he sort of his, he may physically be deteriorating, you know, without any kind of uh, sensitivity or understanding for what she's facing in a relationship where domestic violence has been present maybe for many years. And then of course the economic pressures of the world. And so, um, okay, I'm going to be unapologetic about this, which I talk about as unregulated capitalism because, come on, let's face it, um, the more that wealth goes up and poverty comes down, violence rates in relationships go up. There's a correlation between these things. And so, you know, I saw something just the other day, what did they say, the three richest people in Canada have the same amount of wealth as a third of the whole population. So, you know, we cannot talk about how violence shows up in relationships without understanding the big social forces that are pressing down on people and making it more and more difficult for services to meet the needs of people who are becoming more and more isolated and stressed. Having said all of that, I want to say that he is still accountable for his behavior, right? We're not saying all these things are happening to excuse abusive behavior. He will always be accountable for um, uh, behavior and, um, uh, you know, it's not an excuse. But I think that it behooves us to have a little more sophisticated understanding about what's involved. Now, Lori pointed to this when she first started talking, you know, how elder abuse and domestic violence have been shaped. Um, you know, uh, abuse of older adults grows out of the health sector. And in that sector, they're really just starting to talk about violence as a health issue. Although the World Health Organization has been saying that for quite a long time, violence has been not sort of included. When you talk about sort of the big movements in mental health and addictions, violence is still left out of that discussion. And yet, when you look at the number of people who uh, experience violence as children uh, at different parts in their lives, it has direct correlations to mental health and addictions. Um, and there's, uh, you know, sort of a growing body of research that testifies to that. The, um, 
ACEs, um, Adverse Childhood Effects of Violence in the States, is one of the largest studies ever done that makes a direct link between these things. So because violence hasn't been part of the health world, people are not trained to recognize the warning signs and the escalating risk. So there are limited, there's a limited familiarity with referral pathways, right? So um, this is the problem with sectors working in isolation as they have. The VAW sector, the violence against women sector, on the other hand, you know, has been focused on abused women, and so the language has been, um, you know, sort of to that vein. And they're not prepared to deal with older adults, and the crisis shelters are designed for younger women. And there's few options for men because men do experience domestic violence. Um, you know, they're not they're not killed. They're not um, being having serious injuries at the same rate as women, but they do experience it. And so, you know, the outreach services are just not designed um, to accommodate um, uh, people experiencing violence in the relationships, and housing is always a huge issue. So, you know, there's many consequences of this, right? Health impacts that are attributed to domestic violence. And in a deteriorating health situation, the abuse may escalate or shift to include mutual abuse or even retaliation. Uh, you know, and the risk is likely to escalate because both of these people are becoming more and more isolated. And as they become more isolated, uh, the violence is likely to increase. And you know, I want to say that we've had a couple of cases in Ontario in the last few years where there was a murder-suicide in an older couple where domestic violence was not present, uh, there was no history of domestic violence that was discernible, um, but they were running out of options in terms of deteriorating health situations and not knowing uh, what to do about it. And so murder-suicide uh, seemed like a solution, and I think that we all need to be, um, you know, have the hair on our arms standing up as we, you know, think about what that means in our society. So, you know, we really do need to find ways to open up these conversations between sectors and communities and to talk about the issues, you know, from that whole um, ecological perspective. It's not just about people, it's policies and economics and lots of factors. But we can break it down into individual situations to understand how it plays out. So for me, there comes down to having some questions for these two sectors that we haven't done any research about that we should, right? So how does risk change when health issues force one partner to be the caregiver for the other? So what about when the historical abuser is um, the caregiver? What does that mean? And what about when the victim is the caregiver? How does that impact on, uh, it, you know, sort of in situations of domestic violence? How prepared are healthcare? Thanks. How prepared are healthcare workers to recognize and respond to domestic violence? And how do we recognize high risk in these cases? Because the risks are different. And I think that we should be looking at um, the overlap between the risk of suicide and the risk of homicide in uh, domestic uh, situations in older couples. And then, of course, always, how well are community services communicating with one another, uh, especially on high-risk cases across the sectors. So we do have resources in terms of coordinating committees and seniors' uh, networks in communities that need to be strengthened. And so I think we, you know, we need to be speaking to um, provincial, municipal, federal, and provincial governments about strengthening coordination and building the capacity of people to talk to each other and to address the high-risk situations. They're always sort of the smaller uh, number of cases, right? Um, and we do have to deal with them more effectively. And then we need to be having conversations about how to intervene much earlier if we're recognizing warning signs uh, and risk factors and supporting each other and figuring out how to deal with them. So that's the end of my presentation. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Margaret. I'm just going to take the power back <laughs> just so we can go through a last few little uh, slides. but. We can get started with the question and answer. We have 10 minutes. So if anyone has a question right now, um, raise your hand through the, uh, the chat box or even start speaking now. I will unmute everyone. 
right now. Okay, go for it. Ooh, being shy. Does anyone have any questions? I, I had a question for Lori, actually. It's Margaret. Yes. <laughs> Lori, you made a comment about 82% of uh, you know, uh, women in the study talked about needing different kinds of supports in shelters. And I wondered if you had a sense about what, what is different about the supports that are being called for. Yeah, that's a, a am I unmuted here? Yes, yeah. you are. Okay. Um, yeah, that's a really good point. From from the research that we've done, um, you know, you had talked some about health, Margaret, and you know, we've not really thought about these shelters as being places where women who have health challenges might need support. So um, there certainly can be some issues around accessibility, the physical design, um, private spaces that are quiet. Um, supports for providing health care, supports with medications. I'm not sure if that's exactly what you mean, but that's some of the areas that we've been, been thinking that, um, you know, shelters don't necessarily do a very good job in, in those ways of, of working with older women. Mm -hmm. I've got a question for you as well, Lori, from Lisa Harrison. She is asking if you can reiterate the long-term solutions uh, regarding the, well, actually, both short-term and long-term solutions for all the yeah. results. Okay, yeah, thank you for that question. I don't know if I really did um, specify what we <laughs> need to do in the short and long term, but I, I think that that's a, a really relevant issue to think about, and, and that's certainly an area that um, probably with my colleagues we should 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 kind of do some thinking about that and what could be done. Um, certainly in, in dealing with women experiencing intimate partner violence, the, the short-term issues often are safety and security. Um, so that, you know, in thinking about that with older women, you know, as I said, and as Margaret said too, um, you know, leaving um, a, a person's life and, and situation might be particularly challenging and specific barriers for, for older women. So, you know, in the intimate partner violence world, the idea was often to, to separate the woman from from the situation. So I think we do need to think about what are some other options and ways um, can we work on this issue as opposed to just simply, you know, taking the woman out of her home environment. So I think that that's a, a really good question. Um, in terms of the long-term solutions, again, I don't think we have really great options. I, I referred to that article that talked about, you know, um, some examples of services for older women that in the short term were like emergency shelters and housing. And in the long term, um, um, perhaps a supported care environments like assisted living and perhaps nursing care that are specifically designed to meet the needs of older abused women. And we, we do have a few examples of that. And in that article, there was one example in Canada. So I think it's really interesting to think about what what do people need in the immediate future and what, what are the solutions in the long term. And we certainly, I don't think, are there with figuring out what, what these women do need. But that's a really good question. Thank you. This is not a question so much as a uh, bit of information, but uh, Natasha Curran is uh, saying that the Public Health Agency of Canada is distributing the It's Not Right materials, um, and you can call 1-800-O-Canada, or you can go to the uh, Public Health Agency of Canada website to find some of them. Um, uh, Sherry, Sherry. Oh, Sherry, you've got some feedback. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, I'll write it down. Oh. Never mind. Never mind. Never mind. Never mind. Ooh. I think you need to turn off uh, your either speakers or you can also use the chat box if you have a screen in front of you. Anyone else has any questions? While you think about it, or maybe type your questions, I just want to let you know that, as I mentioned at the start of this uh, presentation, we have a short survey about the webinar that is up. You can see the link on the slide on my screen right now. 
<clears throat> we just want to know, you know how we're doing, and it's actually helping us shape the next webinars that we intend on presenting. So if you could take a minute to uh, take that survey, you have it until February 2nd, it would be much appreciated. And once again, this was uh, the second webinar as part of our Family Violence Initiative uh, program, which was uh, funded by the Department of Justice. Uh, we are very, very proud to uh, have been the recipient of this uh, fund so that we can work and provide, gather and provide a lot of um, resources around Canada around family violence. If you want to know more about it, if you want to find the master list uh, of this project, which will be completed in March, you can find it all at the hub, cnpa.ca, and you can look with the tag or keyword FVIF for Family Violence Initiative Funds. And once again, if you have any further uh, question, you can either email me at CNPA, my email is right here, or you can find Lori and Margaret's email addresses on the first slide of this presentation. And of course, you can always connect with social media. Does anyone else have questions? Uh, Benedict, it's Margaret. I, I just I wanted to add, I don't know whether people are aware of this, but uh, my colleague Peter Jaffe is also um, leading a very large project um, it's a federal project uh, funded um, by the Public Health Agency to develop domestic violence um, review um, committees uh, all over the country. So similar to the Ontario um, Domestic Violence Death Review Committee, there will be, they're working on establishing them across the country. I think this will be a great um, resource for us in terms of generating the data that we need about the kinds of recommendations um, that will help us address the issue more specifically. Wonderful, thank you. And Lisa Harrison is asking another question, and I think this question actually applies to everyone who is uh, participating today, uh, asking if there were any specific programs or resources available for the West Coast. So mm -hmm. if anyone wants to pitch in any new additional resource available, now is your time. Sherry is answering, I hope you can see this, uh, Sherry is uh, the Executive Director of the BC Community Response Networks and you can email her at ed, for Executive Director, at bccrns.ca for information as well. And of course you can check cnpa.ca, we uh, organize our resources by provinces. Um, it, we always welcome also recommendations for new ones. So if you have something going on that you want to share, uh, send me an email and I'll be happy to look into it and put it on the hub. I also wanted to thank you, Benedict, and uh, CNPEA for this forum and for the work that you're doing. I think it's so important to have a national, um, uh, uh, you know, sort of central place. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure, and it's it's been really great to uh, work with people across the country and to be able to share what is happening in different provinces and actually make the work, you know, like make sure that people are aware of what's going on elsewhere to make the work more efficient and uh, more enriched for everyone. So. As I said, feel free to contact any of us afterwards if you have questions coming up later. Um, if there are no more questions for the day, I think we will call it a day. Thank you very much all for attending. Um, I'm going to stop the recording now, but if some of you want to stay online for a few minutes, Laurie and Margaret, would you have a few extra minutes? Yeah, sure. sure. Okay, wonderful. All right, everyone else, uh, if you are ready to go, it was a pleasure and hopefully we'll see you for our next webinar.